Hello guys and welcome to another Lorcana video. This time we're going over a little bit of an advanced topic, a total overview of the Lorcana colors. What do all the colors in Lorcana do? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What are some expected decks that you're going to be seeing out of the cards from the first chapter? So our discussion today is what do the colors do? So what are we doing here? There are six colors in Lorcana. Each color has strengths and weaknesses. When you combine certain colors together, typical deck strategies will emerge. How do you figure out what your opponent is playing and how do you beat what your opponent is doing in order to figure out these two core questions we need to look at what each individual strengths and weaknesses of the colors are as well as currently as of the first chapter what are the most common deck archetypes being played when you combine any two colors together the easiest way to figure out what your opponent is playing is in the first game your opponent is going to be inking cards since they have to show what cards they're inking to you you get to see what color they're on you may not know their entire deck list if they're playing some more meta decks you might have a better guess but if they're playing their own home brews or an upgraded starter deck you might not know exactly what they're on but there is some expected power cards to be watching out for and that's what we're going to go over today so the stats of every color as of first chapter there is 204 cards there is 149 characters 25 actions split almost evenly into 12 songs there are 20 items 54 uninkable cards and 150 inkable cards now not all of these cards are built the same some of these are a lot stronger than others if you want to figure out our opinion on which cards are strongest go check out our tier list video from last week got some stats over on the side here the average ink cost to play any card in Lorcana is 3.78 which means that most cards are going to be playable by turn four turn five almost everything is going to be playable and in certain colors turn five is a very big power break point a lot of the stronger cards come out on turn five the average attack is 2.92 and the average health is 3.95. As we can see here, most cards have a lower attack than their health. Now, admittedly, this number is not calculating in challenger numbers, which means that some challengers will boost up this attack average, though not by enough that it makes the attack average higher than the health average. This is something to keep in mind that defending is currently a little bit stronger in the game. Attacking is slightly weaker. And on average, each character will make 1.58 lore. Uh, this just goes along with a gut feeling that I know most players are feeling right now, is that cards that quest for one lore, every card quests for one lore, don't really need to worry about it. Cards that quest for two lore, above this average, need to be dealt with pretty quickly. Cards that quest for three or four or more lore need to die instantly or you lose the game. So going over Amber, looking at the stats, we have 24 characters in Amber, seven actions split almost evenly into three songs. There are three items of those 24 characters, 10 of them quest for two or more lore already on their card, and 14 characters quest for exactly one. There are only eight uninkable cards in Amber, which is pretty good. For our stats, we've got the average ink cost is 3.81, a little bit higher than the average, uh, which means that some of your amber cards are going to be costing more than the average of a card in Lorcana, which is not ideal, but not much more, so it's not bad. The average attack is 2.41, which is a little bit below the average attack, and 3.83 average health is a little bit low, below that as well. At a 1.5 average lore, they are just slightly understated across the board and a little bit overcosted. Now, what are we doing with Amber? All of our cards cost a little bit more and are a little bit worse on the stats, but that's not where Amber excels. Amber excels in their effects. They have 13 heroes and 6 princesses. Princesses here is a relevant keyword, though heroes may be in the future, so we will be keeping track of this since there is a lot of heroes in the game. They have 7 healing cards. These cards uh, can take advantage of some of the higher defenses that some of the Amber cards have to keep their cards alive. Also, when combined with other colors that have high health, uh, this can really, really swing some of that combat math into your favor. They have 2 cards that cheat mana, which allow you to play cards earlier than you normally should at the 1 ink per turn. They have 3 cards that sing. These are the only singers in the game currently, and they have 3 bodyguards. Their general strategy is that since they have high cost, they do need synergies in order to get on the board. If there is a lot of amber cards on the board, you are they are probably not feeling those uh, stat burdens as heavily. They care about having characters on the board and in hand and in the discard, and they care about songs. Uh, if you are seeing an amber deck, expect them to be singing a lot. They have a strong early game and mid game, but they tend to run out of gas in the late game. They really need some consistent draw engines like Ursula's Shell Necklace if they're playing the Songs deck, or really big Rapunzel hits to keep the card draw up. Other options for Amber for card draw are the uh, Surfer Stitch and the Rockstar Stitch, though those require other cards to already be on board or other specific characters in hand in order to really get the maximum value. 
Amber has no removal. They have no way to get damage onto your opponent's cards. They have no way to get opponent's cards off the board. They don't really attack very well because of their low attack stat. And Amber does not have any challengers. So that low attack stat is really fully being felt by Amber. Their late game requires synergies, which means that if you kill all their stuff, they lose the game. Amber is a very strong color right now, but it does have very specific weaknesses that certain decks can take a hold of. Looking at the stats of Amethyst here, we have 27 characters, which is a little bit more than the 24 characters of Amber, even though they do care more about having characters on the board specifically. There are four actions in Amethyst, two of which are songs. There are three items in Amethyst, most of which are quite strong. Uh, there are 10 characters that quest for two or more on their card, and there are 17 characters that quest for one. There are 13 uninkable cards in Amethyst, making them the color with the most uninkable cards. Uh, also, most of their characters don't quest for very much. They have a lot of characters, but most of them are questing for only one. Their average stats, they have a 3.41 average ink cost, which is good. Their cards tend to be a little bit on the cheaper side. 2.41 average attack, which is not ideal, but Amethyst is one of the two big challenger colors, so this does get short up a little bit. They have a 3.81 average health, which is not great, and a 1.48 average lore that we can see kind of borne out here already. What is the strategy of Amethyst? They have 10 villains, which is important for the Amber Amethyst deck. They have 13 sorcerers, which currently doesn't matter. Matter, but if it does in the future, Amethyst will be the go-to color for those sorcerers. They have five card draw cards and four filter cards. Filter cards allow you to manipulate the top of your deck without actually drawing them. This is the big reason a lot of people are in Amethyst right now. They also have four freeze effects, some of which are a little bit stronger than others, but they are there nonetheless. They have three evasive characters, two rush characters, and two challenge characters. The challenge characters in this archetype are incredibly strong as well, being the two mana facilia and the four mana Jafar. Overall, the strategy of Amethyst, they have cheap costs, they have tons of card draw and filter filtering. They have the ability to freeze, which allows them to tap the opponent's characters before they are able to quest and kill them with their challengers. They have lots of good challengers as well. They have a very strong mid game and late game support. Their only removal is in attackers, however. If that card is untapped, unless they have consistent freeze on the board, like the three mana Elsa is the only one that's doing this consistently right now, they have a trouble breaking a board. They have no late game by themselves. The only small exception is the seven ink Dr. Facilier, uh, the shift Facilier. They also have the most uninkable cards in the game. Amethyst is currently solidly uh, advertising itself as the support color. Amethyst cannot really hold the game down by itself, doesn't have much good removal and has some removal in challengers but not no incredible removal and has a ton of card draws but no real way to close the game out by itself i like to think of amethyst as the glue color trying to stick your deck together or the grease color just trying to make everything smooth out moving on to emerald our green color they have 25 characters seven actions the most actions out of any color but only two songs they have two items both of which are not amazing uh, they have 13 characters, a quest for two or more, and only 12 characters, a quest for one. This is the first time that we're going to see characters that more characters, a quest for more than two than characters, a quest for one. They do have 11 uninkable cards, which is a lot. Their average ink per card is 3.53, which is a little bit under the average, which is nice. Their average attack is 2.48, and their average health is 3.6, but this is balanced out by their incredible 1.72 average lore. The strategy of Emerald, they've got six villains, three heroes. Their removal right now is bounce. They have a decent amount of bounce. They have a lot of revenge cards, which is when they are challenged into and banished in a challenge, they do something back to the opponent, or if they are just challenged, do something back to the opponent. A lot of these revenge cards quest for a lot, which plays into Emerald's strengths. They have three ability ways to stop your opponent from questing altogether, and three ways to give your opponents reckless. They have three evasive characters, establishing themselves as one of the few evasive colors, and two ward characters. The best cards in Emerald are in the three to five mana range. Flynn Rider is really the only card in Emerald that you want to be playing in the early game. There's an incredible three and five mana characters in Emerald, talking the Hans, Cusco, Mad Hatter. They quest for a lot just by themselves, and they punish your opponent for challenging them. If they ignore your characters, the guys that quest for three are just going to win the game and if they challenge your characters they get punished for doing so a lot of these cards are very efficient on card advantage they have an incredibly strong mid game but they have a weak early game and a weak late game they don't have many impressive late game plays outside of something like mother gothel or john silver which really only slows your opponent down instead of actively closing out the game and their only early game play is exactly flynn rider mad hatter is also their only card draw and mad hatter's card draw is dependent on your opponent challenging him so if they can kill him without challenging him which not all colors can but most can um this is a problem for green they have minimal good stats and they don't have very much removal but emerald on the fact that it quests for so much by itself is still a color to be reckoned with the stats of ruby moving on to our red color we have 25 characters hitting about our average here six actions only one song and this song is be prepared one of the strongest songs in the game but it is only once the only song that they have 
There are three items. Two of these items are quote unquote sideboard items, which means realistically they only have one item, uh, that being the Shield of Virtue, but that Shield of Virtue is an incredibly powerful card. Ruby is tied with 11 characters that quest for two or more and 11 characters that quest for one, but there are three characters that quest for zero. Uh, they have 11 uninkable cards as well, coming up in second place for the most uninkables. Their average cost is an incredible 4.21. The cards in Ruby cost a lot. They do not have a good early game. The 3.96 average attack is also very impressive. And the 3.96 average health is the exact average of the game. Most Ruby cards are going to be able to take out your opponent's cards in one challenge. They, however, only have a 1.44 average lore, which is under where we want this to be. This is heavily affected by the three characters of Quest for Zero. What is Ruby trying to do in the game? Well, they've got 13 heroes and six villains. They have four lore loss cards. They're also the only color with lore loss in the game. They have six hard removal, which just kills cards straight up, doesn't care how much health it has or anything like that. They have five untap effects, which can be incredibly impactful depending on the matchup. They have four evasive, four reckless, and four rush characters. A lot of ruby cards have an incredibly high cost. Their characters have very big stats, and they have the only lore loss in the game. They have the most hard removal out of any color and the most untap. They're an incredibly aggressive color with tons of interaction, either with their hard removal, with their lore loss directly to the opponent's lore, or or with their evasive reckless and rush packages they have the strongest late game in the game this is backed up by their incredibly high stats and incredibly high mana cost these this is where your nine mana maleficent your eight mana mickey mouse your seven mana aladdin the three horsemen of the ruby apocalypse are going to come in and ruin your day but to compensate for that they have an incredibly weak early game and their mid game is mostly just removal they need to be able to shift down the seven mana aladdin in order to compete in the mid game if they cannot do so they tend to really really fall behind Behind. They have no card draw. There is zero cards in Ruby that say draw a card, and they cannot quest for very much on their own. Ruby needs a lot of support in the early game in order to get to the late game, but once they get to the late game, they are king there, and they can beat almost any deck. Moving on to Sapphire, our fifth color here. Blue color has 24 characters, 5 actions, and 2 songs. Has 5 items, the most items in the game. 15 characters that quest for 2 or more, and a lot of those characters that quest for 2 or more uh, can quest for well over 2, and 9 characters that quest for for one this counts two characters that can quest for almost infinite and one that quests for five and they only have five uninkable cards this puts sapphire at very very close to if not taking the title from emerald for king of questing their average ink cost is a little bit higher than the average at 3.88. Their average attack is spot on the exact average of the game. And their average health at 4.33 means they have big butts to spare. Lots of health on these guys. And the 1.78 average lore. Moving on to the strategy of Sapphire. There are 8 princesses and 5 villains. This princesses tag is very important since Sapphire is almost always going to be combined with the princesses deck with Amber to fill out the Moana princesses deck. They have 3 big lore characters. Characters that can quest for more than that is princess on their card. They have five ramp cards, the only ramp cards in the game. They are the color of support. They have three cards with support on them and two cards with ward. Importantly, one of these is the five mana Aurora, which gives all of your cards ward. Now, they do have an above average cost and they have ways to quest for tons in one turn. If you leave the Sapphire decks unchecked, they will quest for 12 or 13 in one turn immediately. They are the only color with ramp and they have lots of it, many ramp options, which is good because you want to be able to see your ramp cards early and often. And with this many cards as they have, this is always going to be the case. They have useful ward characters in Donald Duck and the five mana Aurora. They have an incredible mid game and ways to ramp into the late game early. However, this color does not have much of a late game threat itself outside of exactly Tamatoa or Bell. They have a very weak early game. Their early game is almost always going to be spent just ramping. Uh, their characters are not great in the early game, though they do have some incredible shift cards with Aurora and Jasmine that can be played early in ish it's kind of the early mid game late early game when those tend to come down they're very draw order reliant as all ramp decks are going to be across any game you need to draw your ramp cards early and your payoffs late if you do so in the wrong order your deck dies instantly they need a lot of setup for their big lore characters and sapphire has minimal removal their low attack set means they are not attacking your opponent's board very often and let it go is their only removal now let it go is incredibly strong removal but it is the, their only removal nonetheless stats of steel going on to our last color here we've got 24 characters six actual Actions across two songs, four items, all varying in useful to useless, uh, 13 characters that quest for two or more, and 11 cards that quest for one, with eight uninkable cards. Steel managing to point itself out as a better questing color than a lot of people, I think, thought originally. Uh, 3.88 average ink cost means that they are a little bit above average on the ink 
cost. Their 3.38 average attack stat that is higher than average is still a little bit undercounted since they have a lot of incredible challengers. The average health is 4.21, which is just a below the average, and the 1.58 average lore is spot on exact average for the game. What is Steel trying to do to you? Steel has 11 heroes and 5 villains. They have 6 direct damage cards. This is what most people know Steel for. They have 3 looting effects where you draw a card and then have to discard a card, which is good for card filtering, but is not technically card advantage. They have 2 gain lore effects. This is the only color that can gain lore without questing. Now they do need to challenge in order to gain the lore, so your opponent does have to have a board. They have 3 ways to stop an opponent from challenging, and they have the only wheel in the game with a whole new world. Wheel is an effect borrowed from Magic the Gathering, where both players discard their hands and draw a number of cards, in this case, seven, a full new hand. This is an incredibly powerful card draw for Steel. They have lots of high and low cost cards, though their mid game is not as strong as they would like it to be. They have the best average stats and lore value across the board, and they have tons of direct damage. They, like we said earlier, they have the only way to gain lore without questing, and the only wheel in the game makes them very desirable for specific strategies. They have incredible control early and mid game, but they do not quest for very much on their own, but without swarming the board. A lot of those cards that quest for two up quest for exactly two, whereas I think every other color has at least one card that can quest for three or more. Most of their card draw ends up getting discarded, and because of that, Steel can run out of gas. They do have some incredibly powerful late game cards, though a lot of them require a ton of mana, and Steel's strategy of slamming your hand and your board into your opponent means that you typically are not going to be getting to that late game by yourself. You do need help. Now, going into the color combinations, if you see your opponent on these two colors, what should you be expecting? So, we've got 16 decks to go through here, so we're going to go through them a little bit quickly. We've got Amber Amethyst. This is a top-tier deck. They are hyper aggro deck. They tend to quest for a lot of lore early and ignore the opponent. They want to stay in the mid-game by shifting down their 7-ink facilitate and the 6-ink stitch. They do not want to be casting these cards. If they're casting them, they're losing. They have an incredibly bad late game, but they often are able to end the game before they get there for the aggro deck. Sometimes this is Hades Villains combo. If you see Hades Villains combo, you need to kill the 4-mana Hades on site because it is a shift target for the 8-mana Hades that will win the game in one turn. Moving on to Amber Emerald, this deck quests early with the Amber cards and mid-game with the Emerald cards that quest for a lot of lore. It has a decent grind game with the recursion from both Yellow and Green and Rapunzel's card draw. This is typically built around songs for value with stuff like Ursula's Shell Necklace, all the singers from Amber, and Do It Again and Lady Tremaine from Emerald to loop those songs back into play. If this color does not fight for the board, they have almost no removal to speak of. The only removal they're grabbing is from Emerald, which is bounce removal, which is, does not kill the thing, just makes the opponent recast it. They must draw their cards in the right order. This deck has a lot of uninkables in it, the songs build does. If they draw all their uninkables, they lose the game. Moving on to Amber Ruby. You want to quest with Amber early to set up for Ruby's mid game. They use Amber's healing to keep Ruby's attackers, like the seven mana Aladdin or the five mana Mulan, alive and attacking often. They have really good removal from Ruby and good questing from Amber, which shores up the other deck's biggest weakness. Amber does not have removal, and Ruby does not have questing. These decks complement each other very well. However, they have very minimal card draw. Your card draw is almost exclusively going to be from Rapunzel in this deck, which is currently a very monetarily expensive card. This deck can be very expensive, especially if you want the top end from Ruby, which is also costing a pretty penny right now. They will likely run out of gas if you are able to kill all of their cards. Moving on to Amber Sapphire, this is another top tier deck in my opinion. This is the Princess's Combo Red Alert. They can end the game from zero lore in in straight up in two turns with minimal counterplay if they are playing correctly and the opponent is not putting pressure on them. Every single card in this deck, barring a very few, quests for two or more, so they can quest very aggressively. They don't need to quest as often as you do if they are your opponent. They have the most healing in the game, gathering healing from Amber and healing from Sapphire, so once they are set up, you must one-shot all of their cards or they will fully heal them next turn. All of these cards have a fairly high health but low attack, which means they cannot fight for the board, and their only removal across these two colors is going to be Let It Go, which ramps you. They have a fairly weak early game and a fairly weak late game, but to make up for it, they have the best mid game in the in the game right now. Uh, turns 4, 5, and 6 are when the Princess's deck is going to be killing you into the sun. Moving on to Amber Steel, this is an incredibly early game focused deck. They want to quest early with the Amber cards and fight early with the steel cards, the cheap steel cards. They want to control the board mid game with steel's direct damage, but they can quickly run out of gas without synergy cards to refill their hand. They want, you want to save removal for anything that quests for two or more because this is likely the bodyguards deck. Bodyguards make it hard for you to challenge their cards that they want to be protecting. The cards that they want to be protecting are typically going to be cards that quest for two or more. Even if it sucks and you have to use a dragon fire on a two cost card that quests for two, you must do it because the bodyguards themselves are not incredible. Moving on to Amethyst Emerald, this is a mid-range value deck. They have a 
decent early game between Flynn Rider from Emerald and the one Ink Maleficent from Amethyst. Their card draw from Amethyst is going to keep all of those two plus Emerald Questers in hand and problematic. You kill one Hans, they're going to have three more in the hand because of all the card draw that Amethyst is offering. They do not have any real top end, however. There is no one card that you're terrified of, but the big questers that are coming out from Emerald, being Hans, Mad Hatter, and Kuzco, as our big offenders here from Emerald, uh, are going to be coming down consistently over and over and over again with Amethyst card draw. However, this deck has almost no removal. This is a very similar problem to our Amber Emerald color. A lot of this deck is not going to be able to play the good challengers from Amethyst while still having all of the good questers from Emerald and the good card draw from Amethyst, which means that, again, they're only removal is going to be bounce they have a their weak early game can be exploited they are often going to be taking the first few turns off to get their amethyst engine set up and their card draw going before they start slamming down their emerald wind conditions if you can stave up your removal to kill the emerald wind conditions before they start questing or just quest faster than they are after they have time to get set up you can win the game against this deck this next up we've got amethyst ruby this is a top tier deck as a mid-range control deck they have Tons and tons and tons of removal between Ruby's direct damage and direct removal effects and the challengers from Amethyst. Amethyst will continually keeping draw cards to keep the deck stacked up on removal. They will just one for one you into the sun every single turn until they can get to Ruby's late game. The Ruby's uh, Three Horsemen of the Apocalypse being Aladdin, Mickey Mouse, and Maleficent. This deck does have to naturally ink up to nine mana, however, in order to play their Maleficent as they do not have any ramp um, and they have an almost non-existent early game. Ruby still struggles in the early game and Amethyst tends to as well outside of stuff specifically like the one mana maleficent uh, this deck comes online on turn five and not a minute sooner uh, this can sometimes be too late especially into the amber amethyst aggro decks that are just going to be questing for a million and winning as soon as possible next up we've got amethyst sapphire this is likely going to be items combo uh, they want to use the sapphire ramp cards to get out tomatoa and bell to win in the late game while the amethyst can smooth out their draws from the clunky ramp decks uh, ramp decks need to draw their cards in the right order and the card draw and card filtering from amethyst can help smooth this out uh, you gain value from items every single turn often for no ink cost at all. Uh, they are able to just grind out value turn after turn after turn once they are set up. However, their only win condition realistically is Tamatoa, Bell, and the seven ink facilier. You must kill Bell on sight. They want to play her early and often as soon as turn four to try and get her ramp out soon, but she does not have much health. So if you can kill her before they get to 10 lore, they will not be able to do anything. The weak early game from Amethyst and from Sapphire is really compounding here. They want to be able to set up their card draw and their items from Amethyst, but they also want to be setting up their ramp from Sapphire. However, once they bring the late game to the mid game with all the ramp cards, Maurice in multiples can cascade completely out of hand. Amethyst Steel, this is a top tier deck as well as a deck that I'm currently playing a bunch of. This is a complete and total board control deck that wants to go to the late game. They will kill your characters over and over and over and over again with good challengers from Amethyst and good direct damage from Steel. Because they have the good challengers from Steel, and the freeze ability from amethyst they are able to stop your cards from questing at all when you play a card down it cannot quest the turn it comes out they use a freeze effect to tap it and a challenger to kill it they want to swarm the game late with beast mirror or magic mirror and guys the quest for one uh, without key items this deck can run out of gas if you're able to pop the beast mirror or if they draw bad and are forced to keep uninkable cards stuck in hand this can be problematic for this deck they want to vomit their hand onto the board and if they do not have cards in hand they cannot keep putting pressure on you they don't have very much early game pressure because they don't quest for very much without swarming the board and they can only do that in the mid to late game the cornerstone to beating this deck is if you have a card with a board and a card that can untap consistently this is primarily going to be coming from a ruby emerald deck with incredible ward threats like kuzco and aladdin with the shield of virtue to untap them amethyst steel must deal with the item in order to break this lock otherwise they just can't do it emerald ruby this is a very powerful mid-range deck with mid and late game options they're incredibly protective of their cards with all the revenge effects from emerald and the untap abilities from ruby their cards quest for a ton the, even though the ruby cards do not quest for an incredible amount by themselves a lot of them can really punish your opponent for with the aladdin killing stuff and then basically questing as well uh ruby can close out the games that emerald can sometimes struggle to finish up with their incredibly powerful late game however these colors have almost no card draw at all the only card draw in this deck is going to be mad hatter the lore loss from ruby can attempt to slow the game down so that they can naturally ink all their cards but against certain aggro decks this is not enough this is another ruby deck that really only comes alive on turn five and this is compounded by emerald's incredible five drop suite which means that their early game is almost non-existent next up we've got emerald sapphire this deck is admittedly not very cohesive right now uh they feel like they want to be pulling in different deck directions this is why i have seen literally nobody even try to mess around with this deck um now i haven't done an incredible amount of research on that claim but all, all the players at my locals a lot of the deck 
deck lists that I've been seeing online have not been messing with this color combination at all, and I think currently there's a good reason for it. This deck is bad. Next up, we've got Emerald Steel. This is likely going to be a gimmick mill deck that is currently running around. I don't think this deck is very strong, but it might pick up some pace, so it's good to be aware of it. They want to use a whole new world to make both players discard their hand and draw seven cards, using Lady Tremaine to sing it and to loop it back, since she is a six-cost card that can add your actions back from your discard to your hand, and do it again to play a whole new world seven times and mill both players out. Uh, this needs to get to turn five in order to even start their combo. They're probably going to be playing a whole new world on turn five then using on turn six to have lady tremaine bring it back next turn using lady tremaine to sing it it does curve into itself very well but their combo draws you seven cards every turn that is incredibly unlikely they're going to be able to play a whole new world multiple times in a turn and so if you are just able to play out all of your cheapest things this deck has very few removal since it's having to spend its turn getting back and playing whole new world over and over again uh this can be uh too fast for their combo to work uh the funniest counter for this deck is if you are in amethyst you can use your magic brooms to sweep a card from either player's discard if you sweep their first whole new world sometimes they do not draw into a second one and this breaks their combo line ruby sapphire is another top tier deck this is in my opinion the best ramp option though there is a an, a few other good ones uh ruby wants to go late with the fair three horse one or the apocalypse aladdin mickey mouse and maleficent and sapphire's ramp brings that late game way earlier than it really should uh if you're playing aladdin's on turn four mickey mouse's on turn five maleficent's on turn five or turn six your opponents just aren't going to have enough removal to keep up with this now this deck is incredibly draw reliant in the order that they draw their card there's not much card draw in this deck they need to draw their ramp cards early and their threats late if they draw these in the other order or even one of these out of order the entire deck falls apart this is a very high roll deck if you are confident in your draws play this deck if you find yourself to be unlucky player stay away from this deck you will not have a good time with it next up we've got ruby steel this is an infinite removal deck all of the di direct damage from steel all of the hard removal from ruby is just going to try and get the game to as late as possible their only reliable card draw is a whole new world and the deck is fairly weak to ward. If you can just stick a ward guy and pass turn after turn after turn, um, they're probably not going to be able to do anything to you. They don't pressure you very early at all. Both of these decks don't have an incredible early game. And combo decks that are playing against it can just wait to play everything in one turn when their removal can't remove everything, except if they have to be prepared, but you can potentially sometimes play around that. And the decks just aren't able to keep up against those combo decks. Sapphire Steel is our second ramp deck. I believe this is our last deck on the list as well. This is the backup ramp deck to the Ruby ramp deck. Uh, this is using Sapphire Sapphire's Ramp to play out Steel's big dudes. Uh, this deck is less tricky than Ruby Ramp, but it does have a lot of Steel's removal package to rely on the early game and the mid game. This makes this deck a more rounded out ramp deck than the Ruby Ramp. This deck has less high highs, but also less low lows. You can slam a whole new world to fully refill your hand and play threat after threat after threat. Even though your opponent has drawn cards, your cards are better because you have more mana. And if they do draw any good cards, you just use Sapphire's removal and Steel's suite of removal to get rid of it before it's even a problem. This deck does have the same problems as Ruby Ramp, where they do need to draw their cards in the right order, and they don't have as much of an explosive late games with things like the big Mickey Mouse, the big Aladdin, or the big Maleficent, but they make up for it with a better early game and a smoother overall gameplay experience. So, taking all of this into conclusion, how do you beat your opponent? First, you must identify your deck's win condition and weaknesses. This comes from deck building. Understand what your deck is good at doing and what your deck uh, is not good at doing. Then in gameplay, with your opponent's inking decisions, you need to identify your opponent's win condition and their weaknesses. Can your deck exploit your opponent's weaknesses and can they exploit yours? It is often better to counter a deck than just trying to ignore it and play your game plan. There are very few exceptions to this. This is often the rule. Typically in Lorcana, the player that can quest for the most lore on board applies pressure to the opponent to act. It is easier to react than to act because this is a trading card game and you have partial information where you don't know the cards in your opponent's hand until they play them. Forcing your opponent to make the first move and act reduces the amount of uh, limited information that you have while maintaining the same amount of limited information your opponent has. Information is key in these kinds of games. Because of that, it is much easier to react to an opponent than to act. Since the acting player will have to commit resources, the reacting player can now analyze those new resources and form a more informed game plan to try and beat the opponent. This is why in the early game, it is often good to apply pressure to your opponent with cards that can quest for a lot early. You also need to be able to play around future threats specifically in combo decks. Uh, big Cards to watch out for are shift targets, things that are going to be shifted on top of, like the 4-ink Hades, 3-ink Aladdin, 2-ink Aladdin, 3-ink Jasmine, 2-ink Aurora, 1-ink Stitch, 3-ink Tinkerbell, and the 1- and 4-ink Captain Hooks. If your opponent stumbles, you need to apply pressure to them, especially into a lot of Ruby or Emerald decks. If they are not playing big threats on turn 5, identify that their hand is bad. 
Uh, they would be playing those crazy good cards if they could, since they don't have them in hand. They are going to stumble, and especially for those specifically Ruby Emerald combination decks, they need their turn 5. If they are stumbling on turn 5, you need to put pressure on them. Same thing with combo decks. If your opponent does not play a Moana on turn 5, they are not in a good spot. They are not where they want to be, and you can apply pressure to them when they are stumbling to close out the game before they get back into it. In summary, know your own deck's playstyle. Identify your opponent's deck, and then try to poke holes in their strategy while showing up the holes your opponent is trying to poke in yours. Some matchups you might have to play a little bit weird. Uh, there is going to be a lot of consistent play patterns across most of your matchups, but typically against combo decks or aggro decks, you will need to be playing in a slightly different way. And as always in the mirror match, when your opponent is playing the exact same deck you are, just simply go first and draw better. Unfortunately, currently, that's all you can do to beat a mirror matched game. I hope you enjoyed this presentation about some of the more advanced gameplay styles in Lorcana using some stats. Uh, I'll have this presentation linked down in the description below if you guys want to check through it and re reference back to this in the future. Hopefully these ideas and summaries hold true in the game moving forward, and this is not just a first chapter glimpse into what will ultimately be a completely different metagame. I hope you guys enjoyed this breakdown, and if you want to see more Lorcana content, we've got plenty more Lorcana deck techs, analysis, pack openings, box openings, gameplay coming your way. We are incredibly excited to support this game and we hope that you guys are too and with that we will see you guys in the next video peace